everyone. My name is Kelly Hall. I'm a marketing coordinator for ALS North America. I want to thank you all for joining us today for our webinar Wednesday series. Our presenter today is Michael Holloway. Michael holds a BS degree in chemistry, a BA in philosophy, and a master of science in engineering. He has 30 years of experience in research and development, technical marketing, equipment reliability, and sales, along with publishing numerous books on these subjects. Michael is a certified lubrication specialist, oil monitoring analyst through STLE, a level one machinery lubrication technician, and a machinery lubrication analysis through ICML. Now Michael serves as a principal consultant and certified reliability leader at our ALS Houston laboratory. Today, Michael will be discussing new maintenance strategies and the internet of things. During this presentation, feel free to use your chat box or your ask a question or the raise your hand features to ask questions that we will answer at the end. Michael, thank you for taking your time today to deliver this presentation. I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Kelly, I appreciate it. So today we're gonna to talk about the main strategies and the internet of things and how they can actually play well together. Okay, so when we do think about maintenance, there are a whole bunch of new strategies that are being presented. But what we wanna do is cover some of the basic ones that we're all familiar with now and how actually some of the new augmentation that's going on with these strategies and how they're affecting the two new technology that's coming forward as well. Now we consider this, normally we all have reactive maintenance strategies that we perform and these are all based upon failure. If something breaks, it has to be fixed so the asset can come back online again. Now a lot of times folks will consider reactive maintenance as being something that's unnecessary or something that should be prevented. In actuality, there are plenty of reasons why we do want to keep a reactive maintenance strategy in place, perhaps for non-critical equipment, perhaps for, for componentry that we can't pre necessarily predict failure, or if that failure doesn't necessarily have a huge impact on our overall process. It's preventive maintenance. That's always predicated around the scheduled event of, of things. For instance, changing oil at a predetermined time or changing your tires after so many miles. Here we're trying to actually prevent the possibility of a failure. The challenge with preventive maintenance obviously comes in the form of we may be actually removing something that's still useful. Well, predictive, me predictive measurements and predictive maintenance philosophies, well, it's when we actually can make a measurement of something. In terms of maybe taking its temperature or its pressure or its vibration state, or perhaps even pulling an oil sample and understanding what's going on in that sample. And then there's proactive maintenance, where we don't want to let the failure happen the same way twice. And that's when we actually can incorporate reactive, preventive, and predictive maintenance strategies in order to serve our purpose of increasing our reliability and reducing failure. <clears throat> now, in the United States, NASA had actually done a study back in 2000, and this pretty much holds true to today, is that most firms conduct about greater than 55% of their maintenance being reactive. And they'll employ 31% preventive strategies, and only 12% incorporate predictive strategies. And of that, maybe only 2% will look at proactive strategy going forward. Now, just as covering it up, <clears throat> reactive maintenance, the whole mentality is if it's broke, you gotta fix it. It's also considered breakdown or run to failure maintenance. Now, this has been the maintenance strategy ever since folks have actually been using tools and, and making machines and so forth. You wanna just allow that machine to run to failure. You repair it or replace the damaged components when it's obviously a problem occurs. This is a rather expensive methodology. But it actually does come into play with very small parts and equipment, non-critical equipment subject to random failures. Also, if equipment is unlikely to fail at any particular time, for instance, if it's got a, it's got a certain amount of longevity, and if they're redundant systems, these are all good reasons to actually employ a reactive maintenance strategy. Equipment with low capital cost if failure does occur, also, if equipment has a certain reliable life cycle, take for instance, perhaps a, uh, a parking lot or a, or a light bulb or a rail of a 
stairway something, low safety issues, or if we have minimal operation disruptions, if a component tree or a particular type of subcritical asset fails, it's not going to interrupt our operation, our process. Now, some examples of reactive maintenance might be, for instance, a toaster oven. Well, back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there used to be a small appliance repair store in the corner of every main street. Now, you'd be hard-pressed to find a small appliance repair store nowadays, but back then, you used to bring it, if your toaster oven broke, you could actually bring it to that shop. Well, nowadays, if your toaster oven breaks, you just throw it away and buy a new one at Walmart or Target. Automotive oil pumps are the same way. It used to be where you'd actually, if your oil pump failed, you'd bring it to the garage and they'd rebuild it. Nowadays, they just plug and turn, where if it fails, they'll pull it out, insert a new one, and throw out the busted one. So in these examples, we actually have low risk and low consequences of failure. Many componentry in the future are actually starting to work this way as well. We'll see as industry and, and, um, and even automotive and mining go forward, a lot of componentry will be plug and turn, whereas instead of taking out a part and rebuilding it, when the part breaks, we'll actually just insert the brand new part and throw the old one out. A lot more equipment is being com uh, built on componentry like that. Now, there is an advantage to reactive maintenance. You have low maintenance costs. You, have, you don't have to really have a whole lot of planning, little or no planning costs involved at all. And you don't have to have a very large maintenance staff to do it. But there are disadvantages. There's an increase due to unplanned downtime for the equipment. And unplanned downtime can take a huge toll on profitability. You do have increased labor costs, especially if there's overtime needed. There's cost involved to repair and replace equipment, and there's possible you know, secondary equipment costs as well. For instance, an air compressor. Maybe a factory or, or a plant maybe only has two air compressors. One goes down, they're going to require two. They're going to have to rent a second one. And it really is quite an inefficient use of staff resources if the strategy is purely reactive maintenance. Now there's preventive maintenance. Now, some folks call it preventive, other folks call it preventative. Well, the bottom line is, is you want to replace something before it fails. This philosophy is based on time, and it's usually on our history or experience with a particular type of component. This really became really apparent back in World War II when there was a labor shortage in various factories. Most of the folks that actually did the work were sent overseas to fight a war and were left behind with a shortened staff to start to keep on producing various items full of war effort. Well, instead of just being able to fix things when it broke, what they wanted to do is try to get an understanding of the, of the history and of longevity and reliability of equipment and then pretty much gear, okay, before this thing actually breaks down and takes me hours to fix, perhaps I can actually just replace a component before it fails. It's only going to take a fraction of the time and then I can keep productivity up and running. So preventive maintenance really was born out of the necessity of a reduced uh, workforce. Basic philosophy does come into scheduling activities at a predetermined time and intervals, and this all is predicated around understanding the failure. You want to repair or replace those damaged equipment before the obvious problems occur. Now, when to use preventive maintenance? Well, equipment, equipment that we know is subject to wear, consumable equipment, perhaps something like a fan belt, or in fact, for that matter, something like oil. Maybe equipment with known failure patterns that we can predict when, right when something is on its verge of its life cycle, we can replace it. Also, manufacturer recommendations. Does the original equipment manufacturer recommend according to maybe warranty concerns for you to change out certain things according to a time base? Often preventive maintenance makes sense for high capital cost equipment. It also involves low cost components and items as well. There might be a need to meet a specific operational requirement and time. And also, if you consider things like automotive oil and filters, these are perfect examples of a preventive maintenance approach. Now, a lot of times, many of us will change our engine oil perhaps at 5,000 to 7,500 miles. The truth be known is that oil is probably not ready to be changed out yet, but we want to be on the safe side. And an oil change is a lot cheaper than an engine failure. But a lot of times we can actually get a lot more life out of that oil, but once again, we want rather be on the safe side. 
And the other thing is the filters. Often those filters aren't necessarily completely blocked or clogged or, or even contaminated to the point where they should be changed out. But once again, we just want to be safe to hopefully prevent a future occurrence of a failure. Other examples might be small components on a continuous manufacturing process. If we have a factory running 24-7, 365 days a year, downtime is not going to be acceptable, especially if it has to do with failure. But if we can plan in something where we can actually shut that line down periodically and change out parts so we don't have an extended period of downtime, there can actually be lots of cost savings appreciated. Another example might be a government insurance regulations. Now, a good example of this would be the Rice Act. And the Rice Act is a, uh, it's an EPA requirement going forward where we have stationary power generators that typically run on, on, on diesel fuel or perhaps even natural gas. And these particular stationary power generators, be it primary or secondary energy sources, well, the EPA says that, you know, these things produce a lot of emissions as well. And so we're going to want to go in and, and understand the, how the emissions are coming off of these things and make sure they're compliant. That being the case, they do come in just like if you had a piece of uh, equipment running over the road, it'd have to do emission checks. Well, they'll do spot checks on these types of power generation units as well. As part of the whole Rice Mac requirements, not only do they have to make sure that your maintenance records are in check and you've done all your necessary OEM requirements for belts and so forth, but they started out saying you have to change your oil every six months. And a lot, that didn't sit well with a lot of folks. In fact, they said that doesn't make any sense. Some of these generators may only run 50 hours a year. Why should I change my oil that often? Well, they changed their ruling and they said, I'll tell you what, instead of having to change your oil, why don't you say you go in and just try to uh, keep an eye on it with oil analysis? And so it would have to fall within a certain parameter. Now, that's the, certain government and insurance regulations work along the same ways as well. If you want FM requirements and so forth, there's, there are certain HACCP requirements with the FDA and, and what, what have you. So something to consider is that the government insurance regulations are going to ask you to do certain preventive maintenance that may it, it's really intended to help prevent any kind of downtime. Now, there are some advantages to preventive maintenance, cost-effective and capital-intense processes. The flexibility does allow for the adjustment of maintenance periodically. And there's an increasing component life cycle. There is an energy savings compared to reactive maintenance, and there's a reduced equipment for the process of failure. Now, if you compare preventive maintenance to reactive maintenance, there's an estimated 12 to 18% cost savings over reactive maintenance program. Now, here we're starting to understand how uh, we can actually start saving some money by having some planning. This is really the very beginnings of the Internet of Things the very, very beginnings, because we're actually now able to take data and make determination on what's going on. As far as establishing a preventive maintenance approach, establishing when things should be changed out, we can't make those determinations without data. And fortunately, the Internet of Things, if you will, the transfer of information from various sources into one uh, repository for us to be able to apply some analytics and make some proper decisions, this is the beginnings of it. There are some disadvantages to preventive maintenance, though. One of the biggest disadvantages is you're replacing good parts. Catastrophic failures are still can occur. We do have intent. You know, there is the labor is intensive. It includes some performance parameters. The potential for incidental damage to components when conducting unnecessary maintenance is apparent as well. Anytime you open up a system, you're going to up. You go, you are going to provide an opportunity for failure. Think about this, anytime someone goes in for surgery, there's always a slight chance that that person may, be, may in, incur an infection, or perhaps the surgeon or nurse leaves behind a sponge or a retractor in their, in their viscera or their guts or something like that. Anytime you open up a system, unless it's kept completely 100% sterile and sanitary and dust free, you will incorporate the opportunity for increased amount of failure. So if you're doing an overhaul on an engine that doesn't need it, when you pull everything apart and rebuild it again, there is, a, there is a chance that you are actually incorporating an opportunity for failure by way of contamination, by way of perhaps the, a wrong fit, and sometimes by, uh, by improper process as well. Now, we have predictive maintenance. 
Here's where the Internet of Things start playing. In predictive maintenance, if it begins to fail, we can actually take some measurements and we can do something about it. Some folks consider this condition-based maintenance. What's nice with the Internet of Things is now we're able to actually incorporate information on a very fast stream and be able to take this and make decisions off of it. This will allow us to start predicting when certain things are starting to go south. The basic philosophy of measurement is based on scheduling maintenance activities when mechanical or operational conditions warrant it. And you only want to repair or replace damaged equipment before the obvious problems occur. Now this includes thermography, which is taking its temperature, vibration, which is seeing if there's any anomalous activity going on with the, with the movement, understanding oil as far as terms of wear condition, oil condition, overall oil performance, doing ultrasonic analysis, as well as perhaps motor current analysis, audibility analysis, and even light analysis. Any kind of influence that's coming in from the machine, we're actually able to take and understand in terms of its overall reliability profile. Now, with predictive maintenance, there are certain excellent reasons to go down this road. Safety concerns, diagnostics. Predictive maintenance, it does help us understand what could be occurring and do something about it in terms of change optimization. We could do this with belts. We could do this with oil. We can start understanding the life cycle and do proper change optimization. And this will feed directly into preventive maintenance as well. So with those parts that might not have made a whole lot of sense to in predictive maintenance all the time, but we needed to actually augment, change, or uh, intensify our preventive maintenance approaches with the equipment that warranted it, we can use predictive technology for that. We don't have to use it all the time, but it could help us adjust the preventive maintenance technique. And by doing so, we have to transfer the information. And that is done, obviously, through the internet, or in this, in some cases, the cloud through IPAs. Now, API, sorry. This also allows us to focus on problems. Predictive maintenance allows us to take a look at the structures that are going on within the componentry and identify where the significant few casualties are occurring on our process line. By doing so, we can actually appropriately establish what resources are required in order to go forward and actually solve these problems. Predictive maintenance also helps with new product development, product evaluation, and even quality control. Often, if the purchasing department or procurement department can work alongside reliability engineering and take a look at what types of components actually lasted longer than others from different types of manufacturers, they can make a pretty good assessment going forward on understanding products and what to buy in the future. But OEMs that have access to predictive technologies can also use this information to make their products better going forward as well. Perhaps an oil company can take a lot of the oil analysis data and understand where certain wear profiles occur, how the oil conditions lasting under various applications, and make formulary adjustments, as well as maybe a paint manufacturing company or a, or a belt company or gaskets, or for that matter, an engine company. Now, it also supports continuous improvement and performance evaluations. Predictive maintenance is used quite a bit to cover warranty, both for the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer, as well as the owner. So by using predictive maintenance, it can actually get you out of the woods if, in fact, a, a particular type of component or asset failed and it is covered under warranty, and yet perhaps the OEM doesn't necessarily want to honor that, well, you can actually have some data, some empirical evidence going forward to help you prove your case. And conversely, the original equipment manufacturer can use this as a powerful tool as well, not only for product development, but for also warranty claims that might be unfounded. So predictive maintenance can be used on either side for all the right reasons. And lastly, predictive maintenance technology can actually help increase the resale of an asset. If you're going to go out and buy a used excavator, for instance, you want to see the, the service history. But imagine if you could actually get your hands on the predictive maintenance technologies that were used to understand how that excavator performed over the course of its life. For instance, the oil analysis results, maybe even the vibration, because folks do do vibration analysis on, on engines now or the thermography profiles. All these types of things will give a great understanding of the overall health and longevity of that asset. It'll give you a lot more confidence going forward if in fact you do want to purchase it. 
folks that actually do supply service records know that they do have an increased value on the market. But those that actually provide not only service records, but predictive maintenance analytics achieve an actually higher fetch price for those assets that they do put on auction or they do resell. Now the process for predictive maintenance, and this is what's gonna come in because we're gonna to need to do this process in order to be able to develop our analytics going forward with the internet of things. The process of predictive maintenance includes trend analysis. So we have our, all our data points now. Now one data point's useless, two data points puts us somewhat in, in, into the ballpark. But the bottom line is we need several different levels of data to develop a trend to see which direction it's going towards failure. And this can come in with our PF curve for those of you that are involved in reliability engineering. Secondly, by having these analytics thrown in, we can actually start understanding if there's a pattern that's recognized. From there, we're gonna establish a critical range and our alarm limits. We're gonna play with this, in, in fact, by looking at our maintenance records and how our analytics can actually play out to where our critical ranges and alarm limits correspond with failure and any kind of maintainability that that asset had in the past. From that, we're actually gonna be able to apply statistical process analysis to this. And with this, we can actually start doing things like establish a Pareto or a, you know, determining a significant few of those types of failures that do occur and the ones that actually take up the majority of the costs that are associated with the failure. And from there, we can actually go and adjust accordingly. But we can't do that without the data, and we can't necessarily have the data unless we're measuring it. And we can't accumulate all that information without the Internet of Things, which is basically a transfer of information. Now, when is this appropriate? It's appropriate when we have the potential for safety issues, when the equipment with known failure patterns are established, especially with our critical equipment, with equipment that is subject to wear, and with systems which failure may be induced by incorrect preventive maintenance technology. Now the savings are considerable with predictive maintenance. Independent surveys over the past several decades actually indicate the following that a return on investment is about tenfold over preventative. There's a reduction in maintenance cost between 25 to 30 percent. There's elimination of breakdowns by up to 75 percent. Reduction of downtime between 35 and 40 percent. And the increase in production between 20 and 25 percent. Those are significant savings. Now, the advantages, you have increased component operational life and availability. We're getting the most out of our components and the most out of our assets. It allows for preventive corrective actions to be implemented. We do have a decrease in equipment or process downtime. And downtime is probably the largest cost that a, that a facility can incur. Parts, labor are considerable, but the downtime, when a machine isn't doing the function of its productivity, it's not generating revenue for the firm. If that's the case, there's no income. If there's no income, there's no profitability. That's a big problem. Downtime is huge. If we can reduce, if not eliminate entirely downtime, we can, we can have the highest productivity and the highest maintainability as well as productivity, the productivity entitlement going forward. This helps us decrease costs, and, costs of parts and labor. We can actually have better product quality through this as well. Now, this also improves worker and environmental safety as well as improved worker morale. When things work and things are done right, things are done better work morale increases, the safety increases. There's also an energy savings. When a system is actually running well, it's burning up the right amount of juice. We're not having to actually extend out the amount of fuel, perhaps, the amount of electricity on that particular asset to get it doing the job it's supposed to do. It's running at optimum performance levels. So there's an estimated between 8 and 12 savings, cost savings, over preventive maintenance. And preventive maintenance, we saw, had savings over reactive maintenance. So the whole predictive maintenance technology comes into play. The difference is though, is that disadvantages include the increased in investment on diagnostic equipment. Now that could mean actually having a, a laborer going out into the field, going out onto the line and using sophisticated equipment being vibration analysis or even some inf 
infrared flare guns to understand the temperature or perhaps take some ultrasonic readings or even pull an oil sample. That requires, that requires equipment. It requires training as well. So managers who manage by the quarter, by the day, by the month, they're not going to see the value in this. But companies that actually understand how to manage by the year or the decade can take into consideration that their savings are going to be appreciated, but they're not going to be immediate. And that's a really important consideration. Savings potential is not readily seen by management. Well, this has always been a big, big stopping gap because they want everybody needs immediate satisfaction, it seems like. And sometimes that's just not going to occur. But at the end of the day, we can all suggest the same thing. We all realize that a proper diet, proper exercise, proper sleep, proper fluid intake, proper stress reduction all leads to a healthier lifestyle. Okay. But we're not going to see the immediate results of that lifestyle if we all of a sudden decide to change into that. It's going to take months, sometimes years, but it's going to be better. We're all going to be better for it. Well, equipment is the same way. With predictive technologies going forward, if we align this into a maintenance strategy and philosophy, things are going to happen, and they're going to happen well, but it's just going to take time. Now, the proactive maintenance incorporates all these different things together. We don't want to let the same thing fail twice. It's reliability-centered maintenance, RCM. Here, we're actually taking the root cause failure analysis to detect and pinpoint the precise problems to avoid and eliminate those problems from occurring. Consider incorporating all three at once, where in a, a typical allocation might be of all the assets that you're going to be wrenching on, maybe less than 10% you're going to have to do a reactive on. Between 25 and 35% preventive. 45 to 55% will be predictive. By doing this, you can achieve a much more higher level of equipment reliability and manufacturing entitlement and an incredible amount of savings as well. But once again, it's all about the data and how the data is going to be used. We can't necessarily use data unless we can analyze it, and we can't analyze it unless we actually have smart systems to help us do that. But it is all going to come in from various sources, and that's where we come back to the IoT or the Internet of Things. <clears throat> Now here's a, from John Mowbray's book, Reliability Center Maintenance, it's a process used to determine what must be done to ensure the physicality continue to do what the user wants it to do in its present operating context. Now here we can see on the x-axis where we have money, or on the y, I'm sorry, on the y-axis we have the money, and on the x-axis we have reactive, predictive, and preventative. We see how maintenance costs are associated with operational costs. So going off just on reactive, we see that operational costs are expensive. Going far to the right, to preventive maintenance, if we just did for all preventive maintenance, the maintenance costs are expensive. But at some point, we have to meet everything within the middle and make it appropriate. Now, the advantages for proactive maintenance is the fact that they're the most efficient maintenance program and strategy. It does help us lower costs by eliminating unnecessary maintenance and overhauls. We minimize the frequency of these overhauls. We can reduce the probability of sudden equipment failures as well as being able to focus on maintenance activities on critical componentry. We increase that availability and it actually helps us incorporate root cause analysis. The disadvantages is it requires significant startup and training and cost and equipment. The savings are not readily seen by management either. And once again, that can be a stopgap. Now, here's a comparison. And this was done in a magazine called pumpzone.com by Petrosky had written an article on proactive maintenance for pumps. And this particular scenario has been used by many folks throughout the past decade, or almost two decades now. And it's a cost comparison between pump maintenance. If we step in reactive maintenance, what was determined is the cost to maintain a pump using pure reactive maintenance strategy is about $18 per horsepower per year. When you switched it over and started employing preventive maintenance, well, it lowered it some by about, you know, lowered it down to $13 per horsepower per year. When they started incorporating things like predictive maintenance, and that could have been anything from oil analysis, vibration analysis, even thermography, and ultrasonic analysis, motor current analysis, that lowered the cost down to $9 per horsepower per year. Now that's the overall cost. That's not, that's also, in, in, that the cost of that incorporates the training and the equipment as well and that's per year but when we incorporate a proactive maintenance 
and pulling all these things together, as well as root cause analysis, that reduced it by threefold, down to six dollars per horsepower per year. That's significant savings. If you can reduce 300% of your costs by employing a new strategy, I'm certain that every company would employ that. Now, here's an analogy that was written by Gene Van, Van Rensselaer in that the TLT, which is a magazine published by STLE, on used oil analysis for predictive maintenance. It was written back in 2012. <clears throat> so I want to refer to that. Now, just to pull it all in before we go forward with the Internet of Things, the reactive maintenance example, if your tire goes flat, you fix it. Leak, if it leaks, you replace the tire. Reactive maintenance, the action is based on a reaction. With preventive maintenance, you replace that set of tires based time on time or mileage only. Here with preventive maintenance, action is predicated based on schedule only. Now with predictive maintenance, you replace a tire or set of tires based on measuring thread depth. It could also probably measure sidewall, stress, and so forth and so on, see if there's any wear accordingly. But those actions are actually based on measurement. Now with that, we need to sense something. Well, when we're looking at a tire, we're measuring it perhaps with a, with a Lincoln penny or a, uh, a tire gauge, thread gauge, or just using our eyeballs to inspect the sidewalls and see if there's any threadbare or anything like that. Our actions are based on measuring, be it visual measurement, sight measurement, and so forth. With proactive maintenance, the example is to check your tire pressure routinely because you know that from past failures, this action prolongs the life of your tire. You also, also you want to check the alignment and balance too, because in those examples, those things can actually have a huge influence as well. So once again, we're being proactive. You still want to check thread depth and signs of failure, and you're vigilant when the mileage approaches equivalent mileage of your last set of tire change. Here, with proactive maintenance, your action is based on learning from past failures and never letting it fail for the same reason twice. Now, we have condition monitoring versus condition assessment. And that's, there's an important, and there's an important consideration with both. With condition assessment, the routine visual check of a component on a pre-scheduled exam without history, that's condition assessment, okay? But with condition monitoring, that's where we actually take senses. And we have sensor data from assets and so forth and previous inspections and other components of the same type, location, condition, or plant. And, our, and historic values. Those are the two differences between condition monitoring and condition assessment. Now, analysis defines a status. It predicts our future issues and when they're likely to occur, including when the part will need, be, will need replacement. Here, the benefits of the Internet of Things with condition monitoring is reduced maintenance costs, a maximized production, optimized inventory of spare parts, accurate and relevant data for driving product development, and extended machinery lifetime. These things obviously all play into condition monitoring and proactive maintenance, but in this case, the difference being is the accurate and relevant data for driving product development as well. And that comes into play only because we have an enormous amount of data sets and we're gonna have to analyze it somehow. In the Internet of Things, being able to transfer information from a sensor from a data bank over to a large repository so it can be analyzed later on. Now, some of the things we talked about before, the condition monitoring techniques, and all these things can either be on site with a human being or a lot of times many of these things can actually be remotely done through sensor technology now, be it vibration analysis, lubrication analysis, infrared thermography, acoustic emissions, ultrasound, and even motor current signature analysis and model-based voltage and current systems. By incorporating all these things, we're going to have a beautiful snapshot of the overall productive of the overall maintainability and reliability entitlement that that particular asset has to offer. Now it's all about managing the data. So in this little schematic, we can actually see where we have a machine, and there's sensors on that machine, and that's sent over to a PLC, which then goes over to your Internet of Things gateway. Now, that gateway has got a lot of different PLCs feeding into it, so it's kind of managing it. It's, just, it's, it's the gatekeeper, if you will. And then that's going to send it out, well, it's going to send it out through the Internet or the cloud, 
through data stream. And that gets put onto the engineers and managers and, and directors desks for the dashboards and to set up alerts and so forth. Now, sometimes that's actually secondarily managed through various types of companies that can actually take and analyze and, and take that data and make sense of it with a diagnostic approach and then provide it to your dashboards and screens as well. Now, some questions do exist. When we're looking at oil analysis, oil analysis sensors, they're not gonna necessarily replace an oil analysis lab. Vibration analysis, the accelerometer sensors that we put on here, well, we are going to put it strategically on where these things should be placed, but sometimes a technician can actually place it several more spots with his handheld or her handheld as opposed to a stationary set. What should they be measuring as well? Well, we start placing these sensors around. That's something that's a really important consideration. How should they be calibrated? And what alerts should they send out and to where? We've got to have to have all these things figured out way before we start actually able to actually analyze the data and use something. The advantages of the internet-based condition monitoring is we do have cloud storage for large data sets. There's also a large computing power for some sophisticated analytics as well. If we're doing a vibration analysis on a piece on an asset, we don't want to do it just once a month or once every quarter. Certain critical equipment are going to require a lot more readings, and it could be almost in some cases, perhaps even continuous, if not close to continuous. That's a lot of data. It's a lot of data for any system to handle. So it's going to require a lot of computing power and some sophisticated analytics to make sense of it all. We want to have the ability to use that data from many machines as well and from many sensors. And we're going to have to have a less intervention on the shop, on the shop floor processes as well. So the Internet of Things has been able to be implemented due to several factors. Sensor technology has reduced in cost over the past several decades. That's making it quite affordable. And now we can actually use many sensors on many assets. We have broader connectivity. It could do either through the APIs or for or through the for hardwire and so forth, and Bluetooth even. It's more sophisticated analytics as well. Smarter systems are able to take large data sets and start being able to do statistical analysis and crunch down and start understanding if there are trends and some things that are actually starting to present themselves. There's less expensive storage for all this data. And there's a multi there is multi-cloud technology as well. The real-time data-driven predictive maintenance approaches and it minimizes unplanned downtime and this improves employees and, and, and factory efficiency as well. Now, it's been a bit of a role reversal. The human element, essentially, is supplemented with physical inspections by these types of things, be it looking for sounds, smells, feels. Maybe 50 years ago, an operator or a maintenance person would go down on the floor and they'd actually use their, their eyes, their ears, their feet, their hands and so forth, their noses, and they could actually start detecting what's going on with that asset. Well, nowadays there's actually uh, sensors that can do all this to much more sensitivity. The internet thing actually automates and adds an intelligence to machine condition monitoring and that allows humans to focus on higher value tasks related to optimizing these operations. So we can actually go above. Now, it's kind of we'll throw an analogy here. It's a lot like math. A lot of us perhaps had to go to, you know, when we went to college, we took calculus and differential equations. We learned how to plug and chug. We didn't understand the philosophy behind the math. That's way, way beyond something that we even could even do. Very few of us actually ever understood the philosophy behind the math. What we learned how to do is to plug and chug through it. And that was even before when we had slide rules. And then we had pocket calculators and then we had computers to help us out. But it got us through the tedious task of actually doing the number crunching. It made us go and actually able to use math at a higher level. So back in the day when we had to do everything longhand, this component, there's proponents that say that was a lot better back then, but actually it wasn't. Because it was actually, you take a look at the tool that was being used, and it wasn't being used completely effectively because we didn't understand the philosophy. We didn't need to do it, but we wasted time doing the plug and chug. Whereas now we have smarter systems that can take care of the drudgery, the bulwark, and we can actually use the higher functions. This actually brought about a new cost economics. New capabilities to update can be absorbed by operational expenses. Now with this, there's an upward trajectory. Right now, only 1% of the IoT data is being used. But as the years come, and you notice that many of you who attend various conferences on reliability and, 
and lubrication and, and, uh, and so forth and maintenance, you realize that every year we have more and more information that's being shared, but also we have a lot of folks out there that are talking and building businesses predicated and based on this whole internet of things. We do have edge intelligence. With this, the data is connected. Devices and sensors can provide this kind of information and context according to the analytics. In addition, advancing in this allows us from computing power and decreases our costs by putting more power in our hands, more power in the devices. We can gain real-time insights. We can create some digital twins with this. We can actually analyze data that often lacks the quality connection to the centralized data analytics. It's pulling it all together. Now, instead of maybe only having to take care of two or three presses at a factory, we can look at a whole bank of dozens of them and make appropriate decisions accordingly. Perhaps a whole fleet of trucks. Plenty of new uses and opportunities for this technology as well. By cutting failure rates, even by small percentages, using predictive maintenance can deliver huge financial rewards. Now, according to Aberdeen Group, predictive maintenance is delivering significant results with real-world best-in-class companies, including reduced unplanned maintenance downtime, improving overall equipment effectiveness, and reducing maintenance costs 13% year after year. Things are getting tighter and better, and that's actually great especially for folks that are starting to incorporate these newer technologies. We're extending the value of smaller machines as well. There's a decline in cost of these sensors and storage and connectivity of the data, and that provides even greater analytics, the solutions for continued declining failure. There's increasing practicality to apply machine condition monitoring to smaller engines and machines. The Internet of Things based machine condition monitoring solutions are now financially practical for things even like refrigerators, air conditioners, and even small appliances. So what this means is, that due to the large population of these things, it's bringing the costs of these sensors and this technology down, but it's also going to be increasing the reliability of these various components and assets. So therefore, it's going to be a much more greater profitability and cost savings appreciated. This brings about some new pricing models. Rather than charging for an upfront free for various machines and so forth, you can now charge for use of activation. This increases revenue and strengthens relationships between the customers as well. It's not much more of an intimate relationship. Now there's opportunities for non-traditional market players as well. For instance, insurance companies, they're very interested in this, very interested. Reliability conferences I've been going to over the past couple of years, they see more and more folks from various insurance companies getting involved in this. The more control a manufacturer has over quality and so forth, its products and its greater ability to track every single problem pertaining to performance of the machine itself, it's less likely, it's less liable to be exposure for exposure. And it's more financially attractive. Uh, it's more financially attractive to underwrite a manufacturer of these types of products. We have an accelerating digital transformation as well. 64% of business leaders say the transformation initiates behind schedule. The Internet of, Internet of Things based machine condition monitoring solutions has the potential to free up budget by improving overall productivity and operational efficiency. And our original equipment manufacturers may also choose to develop services and monitoring and maintain products at customer sites as well. That kind of data not only helps the customers, but it helps the OEM improve their product and improve their service. Once again, we're seeing where the OEM and the customers are forming a greater relationship, and it's only because of data transfer and analytics, and we can't do this without the Internet of Things. Now, exploring these new opportunities, well, here's, a, here's where it's a collaborative effort between IT, data scientists, productivity management, developers, security providers, and business leaders, and change agents, consultants, vendors, and so forth. So now we're pulling in a whole vast major, vast group of folks that maybe never had so much interaction before, but are now all playing well together. The data resides in multiple places and in multiple forms, and current staff often don't have necessarily knowledge to know or how to actually extract and migrate this data. That's a wide open stream for folks who want to get involved in training and get involved in being able to manage the Internet of Things. Make sure you have the right data and that you can actually interpret the data correctly and accurately. And that's something else. A lot of times now we're looking at a whole new type of information stream. We're going to have to be able to manage and understand it. 
And by doing so, that opens up a whole new line of, well, educational opportunities as well. Now, how do we go about implementing? Start implementations that deliver the quick wins. Obviously, you can't eat an elephant one, you know, uh, all at once. You have to bite at one time, at one bite at a time, right? So, obviously, we're going to go for the things that are just going to make sense and produce the greatest amount of effectiveness, meaning the obvious and the measurable business for measurable, for obvious and measurable business results. That way, you can take it to your boss and say, "Hey, listen, I'm actually winning at this thing. Let's continue on." You can measure that with the small projects, and then they can be actually scaled up for future plans. The idea is to evolve gradually with future, with future scalability in mind. You start small, get your wins, and go bigger. A focused proof of concept or pilot to clear cut any of those business objective, objectives. Now, we want to ensure that the infrastructure can deliver these actions and to overcome and accomplish our business objectives. So if we try to do everything all at once, it's going to be a flood. We can't do it. We have to make sure that our infrastructure can support it. And here we developed the master and here how we go about doing it in terms of our reliability engineering and asset management is we look to develop the master equipment list by dying, identifying that equipment in your facility needed most. We're going to prioritize those listed equipment components based on importance and criticality of that operation. Those are the things we're going to attack. We're going to assign those components into local groupings and we'll determine the type and number of maintenance activities required for each. The, we have the manufacturer technical manuals, the machinery history, the root cause analysis, findings, understanding why it failed, good engineering management and judgment. We're going to assess the size of our maintenance staff and staff up appropriately or cut appropriately. We're going to identify the tasks that may be performed by operations and maintenance personnel. We're going to analyze the equipment failure modes and we're going to understand the impact on the components in the systems. And last, we're going to identify the effective maintenance tasks for the migration of these strategies. <clears throat> that brings us to 1147. We covered the Internet of Things and maintenance strategies and how can they actually start playing together and how they can be implemented. I want to thank you very much for attending our webinar. Here's my contact information. If you want to get in touch with me, obviously it's michael.holloway at alsglobal.com. My mobile number, 214-450-7864. Usually I'll respond to a text over a phone call, but feel free to try me anytime you want. I want to thank you very much for staying on board today and feel free to contact me at your convenience. Yes, thank you, Michael. We will go ahead and open it up for questions. In case anyone wants to ask Michael a question directly today, feel free to use your chat box to ask a question or even the raise your hand feature to ask him a question. We'll give everyone a few moments. Um, I just wanted to also let everyone know today that we have recorded this presentation and we do post it on our ALS website. All they need to do is just search Webinar Wednesday. Also, we post it on our YouTube channel. Just search ALS Limited to find our channel and then click on the North America playlist. We post a wide range of video resources as well as our past webinar, webinar Wednesday presentations. Also, please follow us on our showcase page on LinkedIn. We post links to future webinars and other valuable resources and updates on all of our social media pages. We don't have any questions or raising of the hands yet, but we'll go ahead and give it just a few more moments. It doesn't look like anything is coming in at this time. Um, feel free to, again, as Michael mentioned, his contact information is listed here, and feel free to access the webinar presentation um, next week. Again, thank you to, for everyone to, who attended this webinar Wednesday today, and go ahead and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you so much. Thank you.